Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 14th of the sixth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon things according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and all the things that we consider inspired writings. It happens to be the 24th of August, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. And we have a little bit of a treat today. It's going to be a segue from what we've been normally reading. Um, we've already covered the refutation of the Trinity in the missing chapters from the Clementine homilies and the recognitions of Clement. It's missing from the Greek versions that were translated, the Greek and Latin, rather, that was translated into English, did not have these 10 chapters from book three translated with them. When you look into it, and I'll share a description and a link from the video that we have covering that, uh, they'll say that it was not of the best authority and that it was spurious writings and it was not translated for that reason. But the Syriac version accurately translated it into English. And when you actually read it, all it does is clearly refute the idea of a co-equal, co-eternal trinity. The very same thing that you can prove right with the Bible by itself. So what we wanted to do right here, Ob willing, is share a few places of scripture that help to confirm there is a uniqueness, both with the Father, who is the only true Elohim, and our Mashiach, Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, whom he sent, his representative, if you will, the mediator between Elohim and man, who is El, the Word, right? So all of these things are talked about plainly in Scripture. You have the book of Yahukanon or John, where it says, in the beginning, was the word and the word was with Elohim and the word was Elohim. It gives a descriptive and goes into detail. I don't want to cover too much all of these things that are there because you can read them for yourself. But I do want, and I want to encourage everyone to go hunt through what you call the Bible and search these things out so that you can prove it for yourself as well to confirm that this is how things were. But right here, the first reference to this, I'd like to draw your attention to the book of John or Yahukanon, chapter 17. And this is the prayer that he gives while he's before his passion, if you will, in the night where he goes to the garden. It says, Yahushua said these and lifted up his eyes to the Shamayim and said, Ab, or Father, the hour has come. Esteem your son so that your son also might esteem you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give everlasting life to all whom you have given him. And this is everlasting life. The, that they should know you, the only true Elohim, and Yahushua Mashiach, whom you have sent. All right, so there's the identity of knowing the Father and His Son. Because if we know the Son, then we know the Father. All the things that we've read in Scripture, that you can't come to the Father but through Him, all of these things are applying, right? We don't need to go over all of that. I'm, that's what you got to dig into yourself here. But the fact that it lines up and that He's trying to tell you what has been established from the foundation of the world because he doesn't change, right? I have esteemed your name on earth, or I have esteemed you on the earth, having accomplished the work you have given me that I should do. And that's a lot more encompassing here than we have in mind. It isn't all of the works that the Father gave him, but everything that he gave him to do on earth he has said he accomplished there. Now, my premise is it's not just what he did in the flesh as he was born of his mother Miriam, right? But also what he did on the earth before then, where you'll see he was the voice of Yahuwah walking in the garden with Adam. He was the man who appeared to him and spoke with him. He was the man that appeared to Abram and dined with him 
and was given all judgment from the Father above, who is called Yahuwah. Right? These are all things that are plainly in the scriptures, but the explanation isn't given. Here's where he explains himself, and you're going to find there's multiple witnesses to prove this out. But he says, and now esteem me or honor me with yourself, Father, with the honor which I had with you before the world was, Proverbs chapter 8, which is explained in the Apostolic Constitutions, which is also explained by Irenaeus and his Against Heresies. We're going to cover a little bit of that here in a moment, right? There's also other witnesses for these things. It says, I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. He has made it known, and he will make it known. And that's a refutation for anyone that says we can't know his name. There was a time, and it's there's nothing that's done that isn't revealed. We've gone over these before. Some of us have. Some of us have not. So I'll try to explain it a little better. But in the book of Revelation, it mentions the three woes. Not to get into how that was fulfilled, which... They are fulfilled. We're living through the bull judgments as we speak. And all of this is demonstrably provable. If anyone wants to take the time to look up the Antichrist for Dummies, it's a series of videos on the YouTube channel, christmasisalie.com. I'll put that in the description as well. But you can see in there the fulfillment of Revelation as it's been happening, and then what is still to happen as well. Either way, it mentions the three woes and the fulfillment of them in those videos. The beginning of the second woe was with the making of the Wycliffe translation of the scriptures, the little book or the Bibliaridian, if you will. And it culminated with the Yerushalayim or Jerusalem earthquake of 1836, if I remember correctly. The encompassing of that woe or what happened in that woe in regards to the truth can be found in the book of Gad the Seer, chapter 1. We've read that book on our scripture studies here, and I'll put chapter 1 in the description as well. In that, you have the Song of the Lamb, which is mentioned in Revelation. It's also tied to the Song of Moshe from the book of Exodus, and it has to do with Jesus, or Jesus, the horse and his rider, being swallowed up in the sea, and all of that entails. Um, not to get into too much detail about that right now, the point is, in there, in the Song of the Lamb, in the vision that he gives to Gad, he mentions three woes that happened to him after his coming before his second advent. And during that second woe, he mentions that's when his refuge would be lost. And if you do a, a scripture study in the Bible or any Bible app and you just put in refuge and you look it up, you see the, the refuge of his Mashiach, the refuge of the lost and poor and the crushed one. It's the refuge of the righteous is the name of Yahuwah. And it was during that period of time in history when we lost his name out of our use in the world. That's historical fact. So as it was foretold, it's also foretold that he had revealed it and he would reveal it again, which we're going to see here. And the fact that people are coming to his name again is literal fulfillment of that. But he says, I've revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have guarded your word. Now they have come to know that all you gave to me is from you, because the words which you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and have truly known that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you gave or you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours and yours are mine, and you are sorry, and I have been esteemed in them. So the ones that belong to the Father are the ones that have been esteemed, or the ones that have esteemed Yahushua. Okay? And I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, 
and I come to you. Kodesh Father, or Kodesh Ab, set apart Ab, guard them in your name which you have given me, so that they might be one as we are. And that's the key. As a father gives his name to his son, this is what we have here. It's not that our Mashiach is the father, but he is Yahuwah, named after his father. And for a witness for that, or for two witnesses for that fact, in what you call the Bible, you can look at, I believe it's Psalm 110, where uh, verse 5, where it says, it's Yahuwah at his right hand that's going to smite the nations. And then you, you read the whole the whole ver, uh, psalm for context, but it's not, it's two Yahuwahs there, and the one at his right hand is the one that he's going to set to reign. Another witness for that, I believe, is in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 19, when Yahuwah is raining down sulfur and or fire and sulfur from Yahuwah out of the Shamayim to Yahuwah is mentioned. And Irenaeus, the taught one of Polycarp, who was the taught one of Yahukanon, who was the taught one of our Mashiach, he mentions that it was our Mashiach foretelling to Abraham, who is a foreteller, the truth that he would appear as a man, that he would dine and converse with them, that he would be given all authority from the Father and be called Yahuwah. All of these things you can read plainly right there in Genesis, but it's not explained until afterwards in writings that we don't even consider the Bible or Scripture by and large. But it is considered things that we must regard if you follow Scripture. And just to recap, we've gone over that before, but for anyone that wants to follow along with the train of thought there, the entirety of the original covenant was given and Moshe told them that there is one coming like unto me in all things that you must listen to. And if you don't listen to him, you will, your soul will be cut off from amongst the people. And that one was Yahushua Mashiach who declared it when he came. He anointed his twelve and the seventy-two and he sent them out. And he told them that whoever will not listen to you, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment. So all of the epistles, the book of Acts, everything they did and said is worthy of our regard because that's what he established. That includes writings that they purport are from them. You might not agree, but if you haven't witnessed it with the bar of your own mind, the truth and reason, then you can't make a judgment on the matter. That's the, that's the, the thing to keep in mind. That's why we've been reading through all these things for the last decade now trying to determine what is true based on what is written, doing the things that he said to determine it. But in the writings that are attributed to them, one of them being the apostolic constitutions, they clearly tell us who they went and anointed. All the individual assemblies and the names of the overseers that they appointed over the people by unanimous consent, and that we are obligated to hear them and to listen to their words and be mindful of their doctrine because they're carrying the truth that was given in trust. And those would be Polycarp, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, and the overseers of the assemblies that were given in trust from those ages in the writings that we'd call the anti-Nicene fathers, if you will, or the pre-Nicene council writings. Not all of them are legitimate or inspired and even even amongst them every bit of it that is inspired has been held in by rome and, and tampered with in some way so that whole series that 10 volume set is a great witness of the truth of the maligning the mocking and the mutilation that rome has done to the truth in written form just as you can see with that video from the Maseratic Psyop that I was mentioning before we were recording, that was what the Yahudim had done to him before they handed him over. 
And it was a foreshadow of what they would do to the writings with what became the Masoretic text that we actually have. And you can follow along the history of it. That gentleman does an amazing job of exposing that. He reads the very sources. He goes through the history of it. And it's very plain. For the witness of what Rome had done to the truth, you can just look at the anti-Nicene writings. They're unrecognizable from the Dead Sea Scrolls writings. I mean, if you just take it at face value, the maligning is horrific. It's unrecognizable until you uh, realize what has been done to it, and then you can see the perversion. But because that was not known, it's why people like Martin Luther, when he burned the, the papal bull that denounced him as a heretic and excommunicated him, he had along with that uh, the apostolic constitutions as a heretical writing because of some of the things they put in there for the legitimacy of the papacy. Uh, just to be perfectly honest with you, and I had mentioned before, I would have rejected that myself had I not read the Dead Sea Scrolls beforehand. It might have been quite likely that I would have had no regard for it if I had not read the community rule and the Damascus document first. When I had read those and I saw that the assemblies and how they were built outside of the cities and the, the way that they were trying to have communities like that, and it, it segued right into the Renewed Covenant times, it's an amazing parallel, and it's wonderful. But more on that later. We're getting too sidetracked here. Back on point, we're going to see our, our Mashiach identifying the Father and all these things that you can go back to the beginning to prove. Okay? It says, When I was with them, or sorry, set apart, Father, guard them in your name which you have given me so that they might be one as we are. Not as a co-equal, co-eternal one, but of the same opinion, of the same consent. Our Mashiach said, and we will look at it in a minute, he always does the will of his Father, and he knows the Father's always with him because he always does what's pleasing to him. And that's how we're to be one. Kepha mentions that as the substance of a body produces a shadow, so much more the fact that the self-existent one is, would produce our Mashiach. Okay? And that's the proper interaction. But he's like the shadow of a man, only doing what he sees, only copying what's from the Almighty there. And that's how we are to be one with them, where we follow him, right? It says, when I was with them in the world, I was guarding them in your name, which you have given me. And I watched over them, and not one of them perished except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be filled. And now I come to you, and I speak these in the world, so that they have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Set them apart in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for them I set myself apart, so that they too might be set apart in truth. And I do not pray for these alone, but also for those believing in me through their word, so that they all might be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, so that they might, or so that they too might be one in us. And that's that let us go down, let us make, let us do. The Father speaking to and through his Son to do these things. That proper context is explained by Kepha, by Irenaeus, and by a few others, okay? We'll get to them in the course of time fully, but we'll see it here in experience in just a moment. It says, so that the world might believe that you have sent me, that the invisible, all-powerful, incomprehensible Father sent the finite, 
the completeness of Elohim bodily, but distinct from him, not his own son, not his self. He doesn't pray to himself. He doesn't begat himself. That that is a that's considered a blasphemous kind of thought that Kepha talks about in the missing chapters from book three. So you'll see that there, and I don't want to repeat it now. And the honor, the esteem which you gave me, I have given them so that they might be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they might be perfected into one, so that the world knows that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those whom you have given me might be with me where I am, so that they might see my esteem which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, indeed the world did not know you, but I knew you, and these knew that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and shall make it known, so that the love which the love with which you've loved me might be in them and I in them. And the importance of knowing his name is because everyone who calls on the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. Has anyone ever called on his name and been confounded? It asks the question in the Apostolic Constitutions or I believe in Sirach. And I ask the question to you, have you ever seen anywhere in Scripture where someone has literally called on the name of the Almighty and, and not been delivered? It never happens. Everyone that asks is given. If they sought, it was found. And that's the importance of why his name was taken away during the dark ages where the witnesses were going to be suffering his death and representing the truth of being with him where he is. Right? That they were perfected. Everyone perfected shall be like their master. And he came preaching his death until he returns. If you all remember... He walked out the truth in, in the parable of his life in the creation account itself. Or I'm sorry, in, in the creation account, he walks out things in a parable. But in the um, in the uh, Passion Week itself, please forgive me. In his passion here, he walks out in parable form the truth of how men have interacted with his with the truth through history. You have for the first two days, they contended with him but could not overcome him. And that's the first 2,000 years through history where they tried to contrive things but never overcame the truth. In the third day, when he came down, he delivered the people, he gave the covenant. On Mount Sinai, they broke it. Right? And that culminated in his coming, literally, the end of the third day, and dying to ratify, to, to be that offering, the Pesach offering in every way possible, preaching his death until he returns, which is on the millennial reign. So these are all patterns and pictures for us to comprehend the truth, right? This is righteous, Father. Indeed, the world did not know you. But I knew you, and these knew that you sent me. And I have made known your name to them, and shall make it known, so that the love with which you loved me might be in them, and I in them. And he mentions that wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. It also says directly that where the doctrine of Yahuwah is, there he is present. Um, now, for confirming witnesses for this, I would like to draw your attention first to the book of 4th Ezra and then to 1st Hanok here. Now, right here, this is 4th Ezra, starting with chapter 6, okay? In particular, the end of the age here. And if you look... Ezra is asking a question. He says, Then I said, O Yahuwah, I beseech you, if I have found favor in your sight, show your servant through whom you are going to visit your creation. 
Now we know that he's speaking to the only true Elohim, even though, and he's asking through whom he will visit. And this is his reply. And he said to me, at the beginning of the circle of the earth, so at the beginning, right? At first by the son of Adam. And afterwards, I myself. This is exactly what you see in the Bible where it says that the Son is given all authority and principality and power and the name above every name. And he is at the right hand of the power on high until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet in which and at when point he will deliver up all to the Father so that Elohim is all, and, is all in all, right? I want to find that real quick so I'm not just uh, well maybe you guys can look that up too yeah uh, here we go and then the end when he delivers up the kingdom to Elohim the father when he has brought to naught all rule and all authority and power. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Here's a, the first mention of that beforehand. You have a direct reference that the Father will through his Son and then afterwards of himself. And we'll get to the in a moment where you see that our Mashiach says that the Father is always with him because he's always doing what pleasing in his sight. Now, just for context here, this is what the Father has to say. For the earth and the lands were created, and before the portals of the world were in place, and before the assembled winds blew, and before the rumblings of thunder sounded, and before the flashes of lightning shone, and before the foundations of paradise were laid, and before the beautiful flowers were seen, and before the powers of movement were established, and before the innumerable hosts of messengers were gathered together, and before the heights of the air were lifted up, and before the measures of the firmament were named, or firmaments were named. This is another mention of firmaments that are plural. I don't know of the legitimacy of that. I know of one firmament, the literal firmament, that is the interposition between the other Shamayim or heavens and us, which is the dome, if you want to call it that. But uh, just to be perfectly clear, there are measures of this, and that could be originally Shamayim or should be, but it's not translated that way. Or it could be synonymous with it, and I just don't know because we don't have the original writing here. But it says, and before the measurements of the firmaments were named, and before the footstool of Zion was established, or ever the chimneys in Zion were hot, and before the present years were reckoned, or or and or ever the inventions of them that now sin were turned, before they were sealed that have gathered belief for a treasure, then did I plan these things. And they were all made through me alone and not through another, just as the end shall come through me and not through another. So all comes from the Father, and he's chosen to do, to mediate things and to make all creation through his Son, right? So just one moment here. A third witness for this, you can find right here in the uh, first chapter or of the book of Enoch, what they call First Enoch, or the book of Hanok, if you will. And this is right here. It says, The words of the Baraka of Hanok, wherewith he Baruch the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation. This book became very prominent around the time of Yahu Kanan's revelation and the martyrdoms that were starting to happen. 
a lot of people are not aware, but the tribulation is not a future event or something that will be happening. It was present tense when he was writing. You can look at the way the, the words are used in the text of Revelation. It was the tribulation he himself was also going through. And if you read the Testament of Yahusuf, it talks about the ten trials or ten sufferings and tribulations that he went through that was a echo of the, the tribulations of his fathers, Yaakov, Yitzhak, Abraham, went through ten trials and was found righteous, right? And it was a type, what Yahusuf had went through was a type of what the believers would be going through later on. The ten persecutions of Rome by the early believers, the, the ten persecutions by pagan Rome, was another type. It was the fulfillment, a culmination of that tribulation going on right then. And it continued through the Dark Ages. It is literally still going on right now. But the, the, the tribulation, the after those times is what we're living through because you don't have the open inquisition anymore. There was a time where men professing belief outside of what was approved by men and Catholicism would be tortured until death. That was that was the only thing you can expect at that time. If you were made perfect, you'd be like him. But that's not happening anymore. So just for context. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? All right, well. We'll, we'll continue. If you do have a comment, don't hesitate to say something. It says, Who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and unrighteous are to be removed. All right, And that's a tribulation that we're going to be living through. And he took up his parable and said, excuse me, Hanok, or the dedicated, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by Elohim, saw the vision, and this is, this is, um, this is the critical edition of the book of Hanok by R. H. Charles, I believe. It's not his first, but it's after he had had twenty years of studying, where he's got a little more full information in some of the stuff that he writes. So, it is interesting and definitely beneficial to look at. I'll send. I'll put a link of that in the description as well. Sorry about that. It says, Who saw the vision of the Kadosh one in the Shamayim, which the messenger showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I comprehended as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them, the Kadosh Great One will come forth from his dwelling, and the eternal Elohim will tread upon the earth. All right, that's the first. On Mount Sinai, that's the second. And appear from his camp, that's the third. And appear in the strength of his might, from the Shamayim of Shamayim. And that's the fourth. So that's saying that the eternal Elohim will appear and walk on the earth, which he actually did through the son of Adam, which we just talked about. He just said that he first visited man through the son of Adam. And that was when he walked upon the earth right there. That's what you read about in Genesis when there's the voice of Yahuwah in the garden walking with him, that's how he did it. And that's what that's how he appeared on Mount Sinai. In the burning bush, it was our Mashiach that was speaking to Moshe, the father talking through him. It was our Mashiach that was in the burning bush and was worshipped. He was the one that gave the, cap, the covenant. It was his covenant that they broke, and he's the one that died so that they can be recovenanted to remarry him that's the context there but it's our mashiach who is the one that the father was in there 
then it has that he would appear from his camp. And you can see that in the book of Judges, I believe it's chapter two, where the messenger Yahuwah is interacting with them. And he's literally in the camp for a very long period of time. And then all the way up until he literally came in the flesh with his people in his camp, if you will. And then he will appear in the strength of his might from the Shamaim of Shamaim, and that's when he will return physically. But even at this point, not all of his enemies are subjected or made footstool for his feet, because it's not until after the millennial reign that Satan is released, and then all things are done that are supposed to. Then you have the great white throne judgment, the new heavens and the new earth, and then the Father with the son will be present and there will be no more sin no more tears no more remembrance of these things that are that are negative and evil but proper in its proper time and exactly as it's foretold here so as you can see in fourth ezra like you said he would appear as it mentions in first corinthians and then you can see foretold all the way in the book of hanok here that's how he did that <clears throat> um and then you can see right here, and all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth when Yahushua returns with the Father dwelling in him. Right? And the high mountains shall be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame. Sorry about that. And the earth shall be wholly rent in sunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish, and there shall be a judgment upon all men. But with the righteous he will make shalom, and will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them, and they shall all belong to Elohim, and they shall be prospered, and they shall all be Baruch. And he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make shalom with them. And then it goes on to, to begin that part that's quoted by Yahuda, or as they call him, Jude, in his epistle, which we won't get into at the moment. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I, I got it there. We'll read the whole thing real quick. It says, And behold, he comes with his ten thousands of his kodeshim, right, to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the unrighteous and to convict all flesh of all the works of their unrighteousness which they have unrighteously committed, and of all the hard things which unrighteous sinners have spoken against him who is the truth, right? And think of all the blasphemies that are said, all the things that are talked about. This is what he mentions here. All right, now that's the missing chapters. We're not going to get into that one real quick before we look at what Irenaeus says here, because this is, as you saw Hanok represent four ways that he would come, you also see Irenaeus talk about the four ways in which our Mashiach manifested in reality, the four good news accounts and things, which we've already read before too, but I want to point that out again in just a moment. However, right here, we have... Uh, a little bit just for context to tie in things. This is from Matthew Yahu or Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 21. And he said, And you, who do you say I am? And Shimon Kepha answering said, You are the Mashiach, the son of the living Elohim. And Yahushua answering said to him, Baruch are you. Shimon bar Yona, or Simon, the son of the dove, right? Son of Yona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in the Shemaim. And I also say that you are Kepha, and on this rock I shall build my assembly, and the gates of Sheol shall not overcome it. And I shall give you the keys of the kingdom of the Shemaim, and whatever you bind on earth shall be having been bound in the Shamayim, and whatever you loosen on earth shall be having been loosened in the Shamayim. Then he warned his taught ones that they should 
Say to no one that he is Yahushua HaMashiach. From that time, Yahushua began to show to his taught ones that it was necessary for him to go to Yerushalayim. I don't know if you're aware, but they say that Yaru is like um, Yerod almost. It's he will come down in Shalom. I don't know if that's exactly what that means. Hero Shalim, uh, they have different meanings for it if you look at Josephus and stuff. But if that was Yerod with a Dalit, that would be he comes down in Shalom, definitely. I know that. But it says he has to go to Yerushalayim and to suffer much from the elders and chief Kohanim and scribes, the ones that would be abusing the word, and be killed and to be raised again the third day. What we had just alluded to in his parable there, what he walked out in his passion as well, right? So right here, this one, it really has to do, I'm going to read the whole thing here because it really ties in who he is, what he's trying to say to them, his regard, if you take all these things in mind, who he's identifying who he is in relation to the Father. And he only is witnessing of himself because there's two of them. Everything he does is according to the law, if you will, including what you can read right here. Some people will say that this part of Yahukanon is not legitimate about the woman accused of adultery. And they'll say that it was spurious or it was added to there. And when you take the time to look into it, it was this very section that was quoted by Sixtus III himself, the literal 666 of Revelation, when he was accused of illicit relations with a nun or a woman that he had uh, abused, he quoted this as a means of getting out of suffering the consequences of his actions. And while it was not so much that to reprove others for being wicked uh, along with him, it wasn't that he repented, but that the others were also culpable of the same faults that he was being accused of. So they just kind of let it go. But the point he's showing here if you pay attention, if you go through the scriptures and you read about the Torah instructions, you had to have the man and the woman caught together. And if you were to do such, they were both stoned. But this is not prescribed according to law here. This was done in a way to trip him up so they might accuse him of wrong. You can't accuse him if you're doing something according to the Torah. It says, And Yahushua went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he came again into the set-apart place, and all the people were coming to him. And having sat down, he was teaching them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the midst, he, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the Torah of Moshe, or sorry, and in the Torah, Moshe commanded us that such should be stoned. What then do you say? And remember, read read the command. They had to be stoned together. You had to have two witnesses of the matter. And this they said, trying him so that they might accuse him. Yet Yahushua bending down wrote on the ground with the finger as though he did not hear. But as they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, he was giving them the means by which they can do something lawfully in that situation. Because the one who's without sin is the perfect one in which Elohim dwells continually. And that is Yahushua who knows the minds of all men and knows whether or not the thing was really done. You can't lie to him. And he's the only one that would lawfully be allowed to do that in this instance. Okay? And bending down again, they wrote, or he wrote on the ground, and when they heard it, being reproved by conscience, they went out one by one, beginning from the older ones until the last. And Yahushua was left alone, and the woman standing in the middle and Yahushua straightening up and seeing no one but the woman said to her, Where are those accusers of yours? Who's the accuser of the brethren? Isn't it Satan? Right? 
Who do we serve when we act that way? That's the point. Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Did no one condemn you? Just for another witness for that, in what's called the Psalms of Solomon, it's usually paired with the Odes of Solomon, neither one actually written by him. But in the Psalms of Solomon, you have one psalm called the woes of the man pleaser if you will and it talks about the one who's quick to judge others and to condemn them for wickedness when they themselves are wanton and full of sin and doing evil not something that we want to follow the example of but he said woman where are those accusers of yours did no one condemn you and she said no one master and Yahushua said to her Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Therefore, therefore, because of what just transpired, Yahushua spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness about yourself. Your witness is not true. Yahushua answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness concerning myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from, and I know and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I go. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, because I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. And in your Torah also it has been written that the witness of two witness or two men is true. I am one witness who witnesses concerning myself, and the Father who sent me witnesses concerning me. And he witnesses it by the, the manifestation of the signs that he was given to do, right? According to what the word said. Therefore, they said to him, where is your father? Yahushua answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would have known my father also. These words Yahushua spoke in the treasury, teaching in the Kadosh place or the Mishkan, and no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. Therefore, Yahushua said to them again, I am going away and you shall seek me and you shall die in your sin. Where I go, you are unable to come. Then the Yahudim said, Shall he kill himself because he says, Where I go, you are unable to come. Again, the judging according to the flesh earthly matters and he said to them you are from below i am from above you are of this world i am not of this world therefore i said to you that you shall die in your sins for if you do not believe that i am he you shall die in your sins and they said who are you Yahushua said to them, All together that which I even say to you. And if you go back and just listen to everything he's declared throughout the good news, he said he's the son of the Father, who is the only true Elohim. He is the sent one and the Mashiach. Okay? He declared those things openly, not to everyone, but for our benefit. I have much to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and what I heard from him, these I speak to the world. He only he says what he hears, and he only does what he sees. That's what he said. And just like Kepha mentioned again, like the shadow produced by a body is what our Mashiach is in relation to the Father. Although he is his own... In, he has his own will. He chooses to freely submit his will to his Father, as you can plainly read in Scripture. Just as we are made free-willed, and we are to freely submit our will 
to our Father, or to our Mashiach. And it was foreshadowed. If you pay attention here, you're going to see a parable of this in just a moment. It was typified in Yitzhak, in the flesh, where he was obedient to his father Abraham, brought to Mount Moriah, and offered to Elohim, who provided himself the offering at that time. All a type and picture of the coming of our Mashiach, which in just a moment he's going to allude to that these people cannot see. But they also point out, you know, the seed of Abraham right there for us to get it. So just a moment here. And it says, Altogether that which I even say to you, I have much to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and what I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not know that he spoke to them of the Father. So Yahushua said to them, When you lift up the son of Adam, the one through whom he vis visited the world with, right? When you lift him up, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do none at all of myself, but as the Father taught me, these I speak. When you lift up the son of Adam, just like Yitzhak, the promised seed of Abraham, was lifted up in offering by his father as a type and picture. When you do that, then you'll know that I do none at all of myself, but as the Father taught me, these I speak. That's what he's trying to point out to them. Absolute obedience to, the, to his own death is what he's doing here. This is what he was trying to share with what he was giving to these people, to us and to these people at that time. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? And these, or sorry, and he was speaking these words, and many believed in him. So Yahushua said to those Yahudim who believed in him, If you stay in my word, you are truly my taught ones, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are the seed of Abraham and have been servants to no one at any time, how do you say you shall become free? Yahushua answered them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, everyone doing sin is a servant or a slave of sin, and a slave does not stay in the house forever. The servant does not stay in the house forever, like Yitzhak or Hagar and Yishmael, right? The son stays forever. If then the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are the seed of Abraham, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Yahushua said to them, if Abraham, or sorry, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has spoken to you the truth, which I heard from Elohim. Abraham did not do this. So, a man who has spoken to you the truth, which I heard from Elohim. When he appeared to Abraham that way, as a man with messengers who he called Yahuwah, that he bowed and worshipped, that he cooked, washed the feet of, and made a meal for, that I, I was mentioning that was a type of the foretelling of the things to come, that was what he did. He received him. He took what he said kindly. He believed and feared him. He said, Abraham did not do this. He did not seek to kill him. And that's the truth. And, they, and he tells them, you do the works of your father, who was a murderer from the beginning, right? Then they said to him, we were not born of whoring. We have one father, Elohim. Yahushua said to them, if Elohim were your father, you would love me, for I came forth from Elohim and am here. For I have not come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not know what I say? Because you are unable to hear my word. 
you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you desire to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Who of you proves me wrong concerning sin? And if I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of Elohim hears the words of Elohim. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of Elohim. The Yahudim answered and said to him, Do we not say well that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Yahushua answered, I do not have a demon, but I value my father, and you do not value me. And I do not seek my own esteem. There is one who is seeking and is judging. There's one who's searching like a devouring lion, right? Amen, amen, I say to you, if anyone guards my word, he shall never see death at all. And here's another one there. Other people might not be aware, but we have many examples of men who have not seen death at all. They have guarded his word when it came to them. They were found pleasing to Elohim and were taken to paradise even to this very day. Hanok being one of them, and you can find that by Irenaeus in his Against Heresies and also in the book of Yobelin, two witnesses that go right along with the book right there in Genesis that says that he pleased Yahuwah or Elohim and Elohim translated to him and he was not. Uh, that's explained that he was translated to paradise, to the Garden of Eden. Along with him, you have at the very least Baruch and Ezra. And everyone that made like them. Even in the uh, the Good News accounts or the Besorah, you can see some effect of this in the end of Yahukanon's account when Kef is asking, well, what about this one? Pointing out Yahukanon who was raised from the dead. And, he, and our Mashiach says, if I want this one to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And then it went around saying that he wasn't going to die. Not that that was true, but he said, if I want him to remain until I come. And then you have other examples. If you look into it, Yahu Kanan, he was boiled in a hot oil and survived, banished to Patmos and lived through that. They say that he died in Ephesus, but they can't find his grave when they looked for it. So he could be like Moshe also, who I do believe is in paradise as well, along with Eliyahu, who was taken in a chariot of fire. Sorry, he's also in paradise. And you can find a witness of that in the book of Hanok as well, in what's called the animal apocalypse. During the times where it speaks of Eliyahu, it mentions that he was taken up and brought to Hanok with him. So... There's these witnesses of these things in places that are not what we'd call normal scripture or common scriptures to us, but it is witnessed. And if we know it, we know the power of Elohim and, and the real truth of scripture. This is the Yahudim said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the foretellers. And you say, if anyone guards my word, he shall never taste death at all. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died, and the forefathers died? Whom do you make yourself? Yahushua answered, If I esteem myself, my esteem is none at all. It is my father who esteems me, of whom you say that he is your Elohim. And you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be like you, a liar. But I do know him, and I guard his word. Your father Abraham was glad that he should see my day, and he saw it and did rejoice. The Yahudim therefore said to him, You are not yet fifty years old. And have you seen Abraham? Yahushua said, Amen, Amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, Ahiah, right, I am. 
Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Yahushua was hidden and went out of the set-apart place, going through the midst of them and so passed by. And he was protected because, because it was not yet his time, as it had already mentioned there. Real quick, um, just to finish with this train of thought and to see the fullness of that echoed again, I want to recommend everyone, I'm going to put the excerpt, um, or I'll put a link to the video where we read through this in there and i want to go over it now because it is rather long it's 10 chapters and it is an absolute description or an identity it's simon bariona if you will explaining to clement asita Nikwila, and his taught ones about the principalities and powers or essentially about the all-powerful supreme power of the father and then from that, the identity of our Mashiach, and then the Ruach in that capacity. And then it really helps you to get what, everything that I mentioned. As the Father brought forth the word from his bosom, that is our Mashiach, through whom he made all things, our Mashiach speaks and it happens. And that's the Ruach that does it when, he's, when he talks. So it just as he sees, so he does, literally like a hand in a glove, hand in a glove kind of picture. And it's an echo of that in literally everything that he does because he is the truth. A perfect example of that is what you see in when he's sending Moshe. As he is the sent one from the Father, he tries to send one. And the whole interaction with that is a hand in glove kind of picture that you can ob willing see when you take the time to look at it. And for anyone going with us, we'll be reading the book of Exodus shortly, as soon as we finish with what we're doing. But real quick, there's two things I would like to share with you. This one is from the Apostolic Constitutions, and it is the enumeration of the several instances of Elohim's providence and how in every age from the beginning of the world, Elohim has invited all men to repentance. I mention this because of how it talks about how he does things here. We're not going over the whole thing. This is for El being an aloha of chesed or mercy, unmerited tender loving kindness from the beginning, called every generation to repentance by righteous men and foretellers. He instructed those before the flood by Hevel or Abel and Shem and Seth, also by Enosh, and by Hanok that was translated, those at the flood by Noach, the inhabitants of Sodom by his hospitable Lot, those after the flood by Melchizedek and the patriarchs, and Job, the beloved of El, the Egyptians by Moshe, the Yisraeli by him, and Yahushua and Caleb, and Finchas and the rest, and those after the Torah by messengers and foretellers, and the same by his own incarnation of the Virgin. So this is saying he instructed them this way, and then by his own incarnation, meaning of our Mashiach. He was the Mashiach instructed through them, and then of himself. Okay? Just as it was mentioning that he does the will of the Father and he was the one that was sent and he doesn't change and he's from the beginning, right? Those a little before his bodily appearance by Yahukanon, his forerunner, and the same by the same person after Mashiach's birth, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of Shamayim is at hand. Matithiahu 3 2. Those after his passion by us, the twelve emissaries, and Shaul, the chosen vessel. Chosen vessel. He was chosen even beforehand, foreordained and foretold by his own patriarch in the testament of Benjamin. So he was known for a long time. It was foreshadowed in Dawid and his covenant with Yahu Nathan and having um, his son eat at his table, the cripple, and being provided for. That was a foreshadow of these things with Shaul, just so you know. 
We, therefore, who have been vouchsafed the favor of being the witnesses of his appearance, together with Jacob, the brother of our master, and the other seventy-two taught ones, and his seven ministers, have heard from the mouth of our Yahuwah, Yahushua Mashiach, and by exact knowledge declare what is the will of El, that tov an acceptable and perfect will. Romans 12.2 Which is made known to us by Yahushua, that none should perish, but that all men with one accord should believe in Him, the only true Elohim, and Yahushua Mashiach whom He sent. And send unanimously praise to Him, and thereby live forever. All right, and then this is a title. This isn't actually in the original text, but it's what men have put there. It says, For this is that which our Master taught us when we pray to say to His Father, Your will be done as in Shamayim, so upon earth. Matthew 6.10 That as the Shamayim nurtures or natures of the incorporeal powers do all esteem l with one consent and you find this in the uh you can see it alluded to in the psalms you can find it in the songs of the sabbath sacrifices talking about how the kohanim and their orders the seven uh, the seven temples and the seven shamayim and all of them sing praises to him and in the ascension of Yeshayahu, or the ascension of Isaiah, or the vision of Yeshayahu, if you will, where it's part of his martyrdom, and then the vision that he saw, he's taken into the Shamayim, and he gets to witness the condensation of Yahushua, how he changes his form and comes down covertly, so that they don't know who he is when he comes down on the earth to be born of Miriam. And that's how the principalities and powers were ignorant of what was going on until after the fact. <clears throat> but in that vision, you see that all of these messengers, the hosts of the Shamayim, with one accord, send praises up to them continually. Just as it mentions right here. It says, so also upon earth, all men with one mouth and one purpose may esteem the only, or the one and the true El by Mashiach, his only begotten. It is therefore his will that men should praise him with unanimity, or unanimity, united, right? Without any dissension or divisions in opinion and adore him with one consent. And th this doesn't mean that we all have to like the color blue or prefer potato salad over macaroni. It doesn't matter. It, it's not about your finite opinions of subjective things. This is being of one accord in relation to the truth that was given once and for all to men. Right? To a reason, what a reasonable mind can know and agree with. This is what we have to be in one consent with. And that's what's pleasing to him. When we assemble in that manner. For this is his will in Mashiach, that those who are delivered by him may be many, but that you do not occasion any loss or diminution to him, nor to the assembly, or lessen the number by one soul of man as destroyed by you, which might have been delivered by repentance and which therefore perishes not only by its own sin, but also by your treachery besides, whereby you fulfill that which is written, He that gathers not with me scatters, Matthew Yahoo 12.30. Such a one is a despiser, uh, or a disperser, rather, of the sheep, an adversary, an enemy of Elohim, and enemies concerning the word, but beloved for the sakes of the fathers. That's what the Yahudim were in the position of that had rejected the truth at that time. And when we go through it, you can see that they weren't the antagonists. They weren't the ones that were openly persecuting believers because they didn't have authority to do that anymore. But they would run and get the sticks for the Romans to light them on fire. 
they would be the ones gathering up all that stuff to help them. Okay. And you find that in the martyrdom of Polycarp. You can find that in the, the scriptures. And this is why we, we're not supposed to think beyond what is written when we try to comprehend things. When Pontius Pilate says, behold your king, they said, we have no sovereign but Caesar three times, and he gave them their desire. They were not sovereign over themselves, but for the length of their judgment, they were under the authority of Rome and severely persecuted throughout the world, throughout the Dark Ages. Uh, it was one of the most prevalent things that were foretold about them as a people during those times. It's kind of horrific, but it really happened. <clears throat> Anyways, it says, A destroyer of those lambs whose shepherd was Yahuwah, and we were the collectors out of various nations and tongues by much pains and danger and perpetual labor, by watchings, by fastings, by lanes on the ground, by persecutions, by stripes, by imprisonments, that we might do the will of Elohim and fill the feast chamber with guests to sit down at his table, that is, the Kadosh Kahal, or the set-apart assembly, set apart by his blood, with joyful and chosen people, singing hymns and praises to Elohim, that has called them by us to life. And you, as much as in you lies, have dispersed them. Do you also of the laity, laity means people, okay, just like Dutch, the Deutschland or Germany in English, but Deutschland means the, the land of the people or the people's land. Dutch means of the people. Laity means the people. Laos, like the, La the Laotians, so the Buddhist there means of the people, but it's Greek. All different pointers of who's being spoken of there. Okay, these are all Hebrews in dispersion. It's a title that he had given them, the people of Elohim. Just like you have throughout scripture, these code words with the, when it talks about they'll be exiled, that's the Buddhists. And it was literally what they called themselves, the exiles or the Buddhists at that time. The roundheads from the roundhead revolution was literally the, the roundheaded stars in uh, Revelation. The mumblers or the lollard movement were the voices that were heard from Revelation. It's the very words being used. The protestari, the Protestants, were the witnesses that came about from the two witnesses, right? These are literal words from the Greek, Latin, and Hebrew of Scripture that were spoken, were written, and have literally been fulfilled with words that we use today, but we don't really connect them because we haven't been taught to see it clearly. But Father willing, the more we go through, you're going to see his word is reality. The things that he says is what has been, what is, or what will be. It is how things function. So you can once you know that, you can start seeing it everywhere. That's that's my point. But one of the identifying things for Hebrews in dispersion is that title, the moniker of the people. And you can find it in a variety of languages and places all over the world, including America, Britain, all the common law countries, and elsewhere that they've been dispersed. The laity in the Romance areas, I believe it was the, the laitim, in uh, Gaul or around that area where they were subjected to um, conditions of not being free, really. But they were the Nicolaitans as the conquerors of the people, right? <clears throat> Another one for that would be Saxons or the sons of Yitzhak. And everywhere where that was used, you have um, Ephraim or the Angles being used like a bull, there's other key, and that connection between Ephraim and the bull is given in the Baraka of Yaakov, I believe, and also what you can see alluded to in the constellations with the unicorn or the horn there, mentioned by the foretellers as well, and then directly said in the book of Te Taffy, which was foretellings by Te Taffy and Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah when he was taking her from Egypt to Ireland. But um, 
back on point real quick. It says, Do you also of the laity or of the people be at shalom with one another, endeavoring like prudent or wise men to increase the assembly and to turn back and tame and restore those which seem wild? Which we have a great example of Yahukanon doing that. I've shared before, but I'll find it again, where he gives a young man who seems to be ardent in Ruach in trust to an overseer to keep, and the man eventually becomes abandoned. And when Yahukanon goes to collect what he gave to him in trust, he finds out that he'd went apostate and reproves the overseer and then chases down that man to go save him. And he does everything he can, even at the cost of his own life, to get that gentleman to repent. So rather wonderful. But real quick before we go, um, another witness for the fact that the father appears through his son and that it was literally our Mashiach from the beginning through which all these things are done is in the Dead Sea Scrolls in what's called the coming of Melchizedek right here. So that would be scroll 11Q13. I don't have the number on hand right here, but I do want to just show you. Oh, yeah, it is. 11Q13, you can see it right there. Also, here's Psalm 110, which I had mentioned to you, and then you guys can read that on your own. Okay, but Yahuwah at your right hand, where Yahuwah said to my master, sit at my right hand, and then it's Yahuwah is the one who's at his right hand. So two Yahuwahs mentioned, as I talked about there, it talks about Melchizedek here in the book of Hebrews, which we're not going to read right now, but you are more than welcome to pause and look through that for anyone that wants to. Okay. And then this part is what we do want to cover. This is the commentary. It's not the actual thing, but this is just what the authors that translated it wanted to say, and I want to share this with you. It says, For our author, Melchizedek, is an enormously exalted divine being, literally an Elohim, okay? To whom are applied names generally reserved for Elohim alone, the Hebrew names El and Elohim. Even more than that, though, it says, in the author's citation of Yeshiyahu 61, verse 2, which speaks of the year of Yahuwah's favor, Melchizedek is substituted even for this most Kodesh name of Yisrael's Elohim. So, Yeshiyahu 61, verse 2. This is, uh, let me find that real quick and read it to you. Real quick, verse 1, it says, The Ruach of the Master Yahuwah is upon me, because Yahuwah has Mashiach, or anointed me, to bring good news to the meek. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captive, to open the eyes of the blind. This part is tampered with in the Masoretic text, because it was used as a source text to, con to confirm to the Yahudim who he was, the ones that rejected him changed it. And in that video, the Masoretic Psyop, which I'll also put in the description of this video here, it's a long one, but you can see the evidence for that in there. Very well laid out. Either way, the, the part where it mentions to open eyes that were blind and to release those that were captive, right? To proclaim the acceptable year of Yahuwah and the day of vengeance of our Elohim to comfort all who mourn, to appoint unto those who mourn in Zion, to give them embellishment for ashes and joy, or oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the Ruach of heaviness, and they shall be called trees of righteousness, a planting of Yahuwah to be adorned. That tree of planting is also mentioned in the thanksgiving hymns of the Dead Sea Scrolls, what he would suffer and the planting that he would do, it's pretty amazing stuff. The eternal plantings also mentioned in the book of Yobelim, or Jubilees, if you will. But the point is, the year of Yahuwah's favor, this Yahuwah is the Melchizedek, who is an exalted, enormous exalted divine being, or Elohim, but it is not the Father. 
And you'll see that this has always been our Mashiach being spoken of here. So real quick, this is getting on to the text itself. And it says, And concerning what Scripture says, In this year of Yobelim you shall return every one of you to your property. And what is also written? You mean like when they were doing the, uh, the census there and everyone had to return? That was a literal thing, but that was before this. So different context. But the year of release, just for context, when he opened the scroll, I believe it's in the book of Luke. We can look that up before we go real quick. But when he opens up the scroll and reads from that very section, and then he rolls it up and he says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. He was declaring that he is Melchizedek. He is that one that's been spoken of right here. Who is Yahuwah? And that's another witness for what's known as the Nomnia Sacra or the placeholders. For the, for the first 300 years, they would use the Paleo-Hebrew when they were writing in Greek with his name. There's still fragments of that phenomenon. You can even see that happening in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. But after the Hebrew language was banned and they were burning everything that had it written, they started using placeholders where they'd have two or three Greek letters with a line over the top, and it would represent certain words like Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, Adam, Dawid, as in the beloved, um, the upright pole or stake, if you will, um, the Ruach as opposed to any spirit. And when these placeholders were used, Men would use the regular Hebrew word instead of whatever was written for other ones. And they would do that throughout the renewed covenant writings where they called our Mashiach Yahuwah Yahushua all over the place. Or Yahushua Mashiach are Yahuwah. In the very same way that these men knew Melchizedek to be Yahuwah because he was named after the Father. But it says... And in this year, Yo Belim, you shall return every one of you to your property, Leviticus 25, 13, and what is also written, and this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor, not exacting of a neighbor who is a member of the community, because Elohim's remission has been proclaimed. And this is what he did with that woman. Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Because he was remitting, he came to remit the claims of debt against that he held against everyone. And he paid the price himself. So, and you'll, you'll just see that in just a minute here. But right here, it says, The interpretation is that it applies to the last days and concerns the captives. Just as Yeshayahu said, To proclaim the Yobel, or Yobelim, to the captives. And whose teachers have, I should say, teacher has been hidden and kept secret, even from the inheritance of Melchizedek, right? It breaks off. It says, and they are the inheritance of Melchizedek who will return them to what is rightfully theirs, the renewed covenant. He will proclaim to them the Yobelim, thereby releasing them from the debt of all their sins. And that's exactly what he did when he read that and said, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. It says, this word will thus come in the first week of the Yobel period that follows nine Yobelim periods. Then the Day of Atonement shall follow at the end of the tenth Yobelim period, when he shall atone for all the sons of light and the people who are predestined to Melchizedek. Upon them, breaks off, it says, for this is the time decreed for the year of Melchizedek's favor and for his host together with the Kodeshim of Elohim, for a kingdom of judgment, just as it is written concerning him in the song of, songs of Dawid, an Elohim has taken his place in the council of, or El, sorry, has taken his place in the council of Elohim. In the midst of the Elim, he holds judgment. And that's speaking of our Mashiach, when he ascended again and was given to be at his right hand. Scripture also says about 
Scripture also says about him, over it take your seat in the highest Shemaim, and Elohim will judge the peoples. Psalm 7, 7 through 8. Concerning what Scripture says, how long will you judge unrighteously and show partiality to the wicked? A law. Psalm 82, verse 2. All right. Just one moment. Thank you so much. Hello. Can I not put you? Hello. Sorry about that. I had to mute. My brother was coming through real quick. But um, let me get back where we were. That's not right there. Here we go. I just want to finish reading this part because it really talks about who our Mashiach is, that, that the one coming, that was Melchizedek, who is this exalted Elohim that has the name of the Father, is the one who would be cut off in the midst of the week, as foretold by Daniel, who's the Mashiach and messenger that was coming. That that That's why they ask, are you the foreteller? Are you the coming one? You know, they're they're trying to identify, well, who, who are you to, to both Yahoo Kanan and our Mashiach? This is where it comes from, right? But it says, the interpretation applies to Belial. This is another name for Belial, which means literally without worth or worthlessness. It's a title for Satan. The children of worthlessness are his children, right? But it says, the interpretation applies to Belial, or worthlessness, and the spirits predestined to him, because all of them have rebelled, turning from Elohim's precepts, and so becoming utterly wicked. Therefore, Melchizedek will thoroughly prosecute the vengeance required by Elohim's statutes. In that day, he will deliver them from the power of Belial, or Belial, and from the power of all the spirits predestined to him. Allied with him will be all the righteous Elim. It says divine beings here. The word there is Aleph, Lamed, Yod, Mem. It's not quite Elohim, but it's Elim. It's the mighty ones, or it's, it's the uh, L-like ones, if you will. This is that which it breaks off all the, the Elohim, or Elohim. All right, now this is the part where I was wanting to get to. This visitation talking about our Mashiach, and remember, the Father visited his creation first through the son of Adam, and he's done it from the beginning until he came in the flesh and then ascended, and from that time on, it's been the Ruach that we've been interacting with without a physical representation, um, and we'll read that in just a moment. But it says, this visitation is the day of deliverance that he has decreed through Yeshiyahu the foreteller concerning all the captives, inasmuch as scripture says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces shalom, who brings tov news, who announces deliverance, who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. And that's the one that came, right? Yeshiyahu 52.7. He's also called our king. He's another title for our Mashiach is the Kadosh Yisrael, the set apart Israel, if you will. It, it usually has in English the set apart one of Israel, but those words are added. He's literally the Kadosh, the only true set apart or perfect man, right? The example that we're to follow. And that is the one who is the king over us. It says that very clearly in scripture, but the English translation muddies it up. It makes it seem like it's talking about the father. It says the scripture's interpretation, the mountains are the foretellers. They who were sent to proclaim Elohim's truth and to foretell to all Yisrael. And the messenger is the Mashiach of the Ruach of whom Daniel spoke after 62 weeks, the, the Mashiach shall be cut off. Daniel 9, 26. It's the messenger who brings the good news, who announces deliverance. Uh, and I don't know if I have the next part. Oh, yeah, I do. There we go. And is the one of whom it is written to proclaim the year of Yahuwah's favor, the day of the vengeance of our Elohim, 
to comfort all who mourn. Yeshayahu 61.2 This scripture's interpretation, he is to instruct them about all the periods of history for eternity, which he did. And it's even in the parable of creation account. And it is not witnessed it's not witnessed in what we call the Bible itself, other than from the beginning on, all of the writings that we have. But if you read the recognitions of Clement, Kepha literally recites all of history down to the current times, right to Clement, and then they repeat themselves, although it only covers it once, in the very fashion it's saying here, to instruct them about all the periods of history, so that you have a knowledge of cause and effect. You can see what was, what happened, and what came of it all the way to our current times. That's one of the main reasons why things are out of order in Scripture. And if you're not familiar with that, just if you keep reading the Bible, you'll you'll see it eventually. But the book of Daniel's out of order, the book of Ezekiel's out of order, some of the chronological events in the Exodus are out of order. All right. Some of the events in the book of Judges are out of order. Same thing with Genesis. You can find it and have it corrected. But the fact that it's kind of messed up was on purpose to keep people confused. And he came to set things right and to give clarity. But back on point, Father Willing, you can see this one being mentioned, who is called Melchizedek, who's also called Yahuwah, who is the messenger that was cut off, Right, the anointed of the Ruach that was cut off is our Mashiach. And that is the one who was from the beginning, who had his father's name that doesn't change, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ab willing, we can see that now we know who's speaking and we don't have to be confused. A lot of people think that they're only dealing with the father or that our Mashiach is not um, truly... Elohim in that sense, but he is, he's just not greater than his father. He is everything that he said, though. The last thing I do want to share on this part right here is right here. We've read it before, but I'd like to go over it real quick, not reading the whole thing. I don't know if we have time, if you guys want to or not, but uh, I just want to show everybody this right here is a witness of how our Mashiach manifested himself in the four ways that represents the four winds, the four pillars of the Shamayim, the four good news accounts, if you will, and the four manifestations of our Mashiach. So that is from Irenaeus in his Against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 11. Uh, I don't, like I said, I don't know if we'll be able to read that. Just give me one moment and we'll go on. All right, so looked it up real quick, and in, for everyone that wants to check the confirmation for eleven Q thirteen, the coming of Melchizedek can be read in the book of Luke, chapter four, starting on verse sixteen, really. And it says, and he came to Nazari or Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And according to his practice, he went into the congregation on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And the scroll of the foreteller Yeshayahu was handed to him. And having unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Ruach of Yahuwah is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring the Tov news or Besorah to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to send away crushed ones with a release, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahuwah. And having rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the congregation were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been filled in your hearing. And all were bearing witness to him and marveled at the pleasant words that came out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not the son of Yahusuf? All right, we don't need to keep going there, but you see, 
he read that very section that said that he would do that very thing and proclaim that year of release. And he said, it has been fulfilled now in your hearing. Our premise, if everything is done right, that was announced in the year 28 AD. And we can know that as a surety for different reasons. The fact that he was born in 2 BC is an is a known historical fact based on the evidence of what's in scripture and the things that we know it wasn't always known so clearly but we we do have the evidence for it i'll father willing we can do that maybe this week or next shabbat but you can see that he literally came in the jubilee if you will or the yobel and announced this if that was the 80th yobel then we can reasonably know doing the math following the calendar as it's written, not adding more days, we can know what year it is today at this very point in time. But uh, it's a big if, because we don't know for sure as a certainty that he came in the 80th Yobel. We believe that's the case based off of a footnote from Josephus, but that's the only witness that I'm aware of. If anyone knows of any other witnesses in any writing that claims to be inspired that might point to what jubilee it was that he announced his favor or any of them that we can actually pinpoint for a surety, I would greatly appreciate it um, because we, we are looking for confirmation for witnesses for that. Otherwise, we're we the best we can do is speculate. If he came in the 80th jubilee, then this year is exactly 5,910 from the beginning of creation to today. And we are in, again, the 14th day of the sixth month of that year. But it's a big if, right? If that's not the case, then we have a different Yobel or Jubilee that we have to deal with. So we're still looking at that. But either way, we're going to go ahead and read real quick now that we covered that part. This is from Irenaeus, who was a taught one of Polycarp, who was a taught one of Yahukanon, and it ties in the different manifestations of our Mashiach, but it also shows, this is what I want you to see, that it was our Mashiach appearing to men as Yahuwah who gave the covenant and who interacted with men the entire time. And it's not until well after this creation, after the millennial reign, after Satan's released, right? When we have the great white throne judgment that the Father will himself be dealing with the creation personally and not through a mediator because frankly we're not worthy of them not one of us is perfect and we'd be burned up in his existence it's only through the refining fire of the, the process of time and coming to be his he's only going to be known to those who are his in a time where there is no more sin there's no more deviation from truth and righteousness okay this is Yahu Kanan, by the taught one of Yahuwah, preaches this belief and seeks by the proclamation of the Besorah to remove that error which by Serinthus, a Nicolaitan, has been disseminated among men, and a long time previously by those termed Nicolaitans, who are an offset of that Gnosticism or knowledge falsely so called, that he might confound them and persuade them that their is but one Elohim, who made all things by his word. In Revelation, it says that Mashiach, he has a name which no one perceived except himself, and his name is called the Word of Yahuwah. And you can look all over. You just put in the Word of Yahuwah in a Bible search, if you will, and you'll see it's the Word of Yahuwah that appears to every foreteller. It's the word of Yahuwah that comes and does a whole bunch of things all throughout the original covenant writings. And that is the name, that is a, a name for our Mashiach, right? Who made all things by his word and not as they allege that the creator was one but the father of Yahuwah another. And that the son of the creator was forsooth one but the Mashiach from above another. And these are all different Gnostic opinions that were put forth, deviations from what is written, okay? Satan doesn't care what it is you pervert yourself with so long as it's not the truth. You, you go off in some tangent. 
who also continued in passable descending upon Yahushua, the son of the creator, and flew back into his pleroma, and that Monogenes was the beginning, but Logos was the true son of Monogenes. These are different Greek words that are used in scripture, okay? Monogenes is the, the word for the only begotten. The Logos is the word. The Gnostics would use these words as separate things and try to come up with perverted doctrines that just aren't true or provable in scripture but they're adding to and taking away with conjectures and and things of their own contrivances okay foreshadowed in the talmuds and the councils and opinions of people that added to the commands and it culminated in what we call nicolaitan catholic christianity man-made traditions enforced over his word Okay, one was a type of the other that was to come. But not to get on that, I just want to get to the point here. It says, Yahukanon, however, does himself put this matter beyond all controversy on our part when he says, He was in this world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Yahukanon 1, 10, 11. Yet according to Marcion and those like him, neither was the world made by Yahushua, nor did he come to his own things, but to those of another. And according to certain of the Gnostics, this world was made by messengers and not by the word of Elohim. But according to the followers of Valentinius, the world was not made by him, but by the Demiurge. For he, Soter, or the Deliverer, caused such similitudes to be made after the pattern of things above, as they allege. But the Demiurge accomplished the work of creation. For they say that he, the master and creator of the plan of creation, by whom they hold that this world was made, was produced from the mother, while the good news affirms plainly that by the word which was in the beginning with Elohim, all things were made. Which word, says he, or he says, was made flesh and dwelt among us? Yahukanon 1.14 Yet according to these men, neither was the word made flesh, nor a Mashiach, nor the Deliverer, who was produced from all. All right, I do want to get on to what Yahukanon himself says, Okay. You guys, again, can read this for yourself. He does an amazing job of refuting all the Gnosticism and things that were going on. But in the process, he's also explaining things that are very beneficial to us. <clears throat> all right, so right here it says, Yahu can on therefore, having been sent by the founder and maker of this world, how could he testify that of that light which came down from things unspeakable and invisible? For all the heretics have decried that the Demiurge was ignorant of that power above him, whose witness and herald Yahukanon is found to be. Wherefore Yahuwah said that he deemed him more than a foreteller, Matthew Yahu 11.9 and Luke 7.26. For all the other foretellers preach the advent of the paternal light and desire to be worthy of seeing him whom they preached, but Yahukanon did both announce beforehand and, or in like manner as they did others, sorry, as did the others, and actually saw him when he came and pointed him out and persuaded many to believe in him, so that he did himself hold the place of both foreteller and emissary. For this is to be more than foreteller, because first emissaries, secondly foretellers, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. But all things from one and the same Elohim himself. And that's why he says that there is no one greater born amongst women, because he is both a foreteller and an emissary. All right. I want to get to the part that we have in mind here. All right. So here we go. Since then our opponents do bear testimony to us and make use of these, our proof derived from them is firm and true. Right? Talking about the good news accounts. It is not possible that the Basora, 
can be either more or fewer in number than they are. For since there are four zones, north, east, south, west, of the world in which we live, and four principal winds, while the assembly is scattered throughout all the world, and the pillar and ground of the assembly is the Besora and the Ruach of life, it is fitting that she should have four pillars, breathing out immortality on every side, and vivifying men afresh. From which fact it is evident that the word, the artificer of all, the hand crafter of all, okay, artificial, the etymology of it means hand crafted. So an artificer is one who crafts by hand, okay. From which fact it is evident that the word, the artificer of all, he that sits upon the cherubim and contains all things, he who was manifested to men, has given us the Besora under four aspects, but bound together by one ruach. As also Dawid says, when entering or when entreating his manifestation, you that sits between the cherubim shine forth. For the cherubim or cherubim, Two, and this is talking about the messengers before the mercy seat. Literally, the Shekinah glory, they call it, right? The light of the presence of Yahuwah would be visible between the cherubim on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And he dwelt like that for centuries until the, the Yahudim were so repugnant and apostate that he left. The Ark was later hidden during the Babylonian captivity. You can find witness of that in 2 Baruch, the uh, book of the Maccabees, and Te Taffy. And then the evidence of it still being there in Yirmiyahu's Yer Garoto is known or was disclosed by Ron Wyatt. But the fact that he was between the cherubim is what that's talking about. It was our Mashiach whose presence was there and visibly manifested. There's also representative, it's a type of what you can find in the Shamayim, where the Almighty and our Mashiach at his right hand are surrounded by the hosts of the messengers in the same pattern, right? It says, for the cherubim or cherubim were two were four faced, and their faces were images of the dispensation of the son of Elohim. For as the scripture says, the first living creature was like a lion, Revelation 4-7, symbolizing his effectual working, his leadership, his royal power, right? his regalia, if you will. The second was like a calf or bull, signifying the sacrificial or kahuna order. The third, as it were, the face of a man, an evident description of his advent as a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle, pointing out the gift of the Ruach hovering with his wings over the assembly, and therefore the Besora are in accord with these things, among which Mashiach Yahushua is seated. And again, he carried them like on eagle's wings through the wilderness after their deliverance from bondage has a foreshadow of those types of things, right? But it says, For that according to Yahukanon relates his original, effectual, and esteemed generation from the Father, as the Son of Elohim appeared in the beginning, like the voice of Yahuwah from the garden, or as he appeared as Elohim to man, right? Thus declaring in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. Yahukanon 1.1 also, all things are made by him, and without him was nothing made. For this reason, too, that is that Besora full of all confidence, for such is his person. And that's the way he appears and behaves himself and talks throughout that, that version in the book of Yahukanon, with authority, if you will. Yet, that according to Luke, taking up his Kohen character, commenced with Zakariyahu the Kohen, offering sacrifice to Elohim. For now was made ready the fatted calf, 
about to be immolated for the finding again of the younger son. After he appeared as Elohim in relation to men, he gave the, the Torah with the sacrificial system and all that entailed, right? His second manifestation. Matith Yahu again relates his generation as a man, saying the book of the generations of Yahushua Mashiach, the son of Dawid, the son of Abraham. And also, the birth of Yahushua Mashiach, who was on this wise. This, then, is the besorah of his being man. For which reason it is, too, that a humble and meek man is kept up throughout the whole good news. Mark, on the other hand, commences with the foretelling Ruach coming down from on high to men, saying the beginning of the besorah of Yahushua Mashiach, as it is written in Yeshayahu the foreteller, pointing to the winged aspect of the Besorah, and on this account he made a, compedi or a compedious and cursory narrative, for such is the foretelling character. And this is why this one is not always in chronological order. All right, It's of the Ruach in that nature, and it follows that pattern on occasion. And the word of Elohim himself used to converse with the anti Mashiach or the anti Mosaic patriarchs in accordance with his mightiness and esteem as Elohim in his person, right? But for those under the law, he instituted a kahuna and liturgical service, right? With the Levites. Afterwards, being made man for us, he sent the gift of the celestial Ruach over all the earth, protecting us with his wings. And how he's desired to gather us as a hen gathers her chicks under his wings or her wings, but we would not, right? Such then was the course followed by the Son of Elohim. So was also the form of the living creatures. And such was the form of the living creatures, so was also the character of the Basora. They're all pictures within pictures and parables of one another. For the living creatures are quadriform, and the Basora is quadriform, as is also the course followed by Yahuwah, the pattern that we just showed you, and also what you saw in Hanok, and what you can see with the four winds. It's an echo, or a repeat of these things that he only says what he hears, and he only does what he sees, right? Excuse me. But it says, for this reason were four principal covenants given to the race of man, one prior to the flood under Adam, the second after that deluge under Noach, the third the giving of the Torah under Moshe, and the fourth that which renovates man and sums up all things in itself, by means of the Besora, raising and bearing men upon its wings into the Malkuth Shamayim, or kingdom of the heavens. So, ob willing, that was edifying enough, but I think we've, we've spent enough time. We'll probably do question and answer there. If anyone has any questions or comments, please leave them in the, in the uh, comments here for the video, and we'll try to address it. This is a very interesting subject. It really needs to be something that we go into and comprehend with full clarity because it is the entire desire of our Mashiach. The whole purpose of his coming was to know the only true Elohim and Yahushua Mashiach who, whom he sent, right? So hopefully this will help us do that and grow together. You all have a wonderful Shabbat and a Shavua Tov. We will see you next week and uh, talk to you then. Shalom.